What I'd like to do is tell you what AI is, why it's so important, why I'm so optimistic about it. In fact, I have a very understated title, AI and Human Progress. Uh, and uh, I'm writing a book on this, and this is sort of an early look at some of the things I've been thinking about, and I want to start with a story. And it's a story of translating words. And if you had to translate words uh, from one language to another, and we did that, that was one of the first uh, techniques in artificial intelligence, what you would do is you'd, in a sense, upload a dictionary of, say, Russian words and English words, so you can, this is the Cold War, it's the 1950s, and you'd create rule sets around when you would use one word versus another word, because of course, it's not a direct substitution. It worked, it wasn't so bad, but it didn't work very well. It had some problems with it, it was very brittle. It was really hard to always create these sorts of rules that would apply, and so the translations were not so exact. And so there was a new technique, it was a statistical one. We applied math to the problem, and we treated, we just uploaded lots of different examples of translations of one word into another, let's say, French to English, and you'd use the Hansard, which is the uh, Canadian parliamentary transcripts that are both in French and English and very well done. And you'd look not for what one word represents in another language, but one word in the context of the other words around it, right? And create a big probability table. And so you'd know that, you know, light could either be illumination or it could be liger. Depends on the context, whether it's the absence of weight or whether it is uh, illumination. And so it worked, and it worked very well because you had the data to actually analyze. So what is this revolution that we're looking at right now in terms of artificial intelligence is that, that although we're using the same term as we had in the 1950s, when the project was to enshrine all of the ways in which people made rational thought and thinking of the mind into hardware and software, and it didn't really work very well because it was a hard problem, we're now applying it to machine learning and basically learning from the data. If you will, we're able to infer from a large body of data what the right answer is, rather than being explicitly instructed how to determine what a given answer is in terms of what you would classify or what a right, trans what a right translation would be. And to understand that a little bit better, maybe it would be useful to go back to the origin of machine learning. This is Arthur Samuel, and he was at IBM, and he liked to play checkers. He would call it checkers, he would call it drafts. And what he did is he wrote a program to play the machine, and of course he played and he won, and the reason why is that uh, the machine only knew what a legal move was, and he understood something else, he understood strategy. So he played it some more, it still went, won, he left the machine to play itself, and eventually it got so good because it got more data, it increased the accuracy of its predictions, and eventually it would always win. And so if you will, Arthur Samuel created a machine that could exceed his abilities in a task that he taught it. So where are we going to go with this? Well, one place where we use it, of course, is with AlphaGo. It was able to look at millions of examples of high-quality games and could become the best Go player. AlphaGo Zero, which was just released several weeks ago, did something even more interesting. It simply didn't actually use any of the human games and get better by pattern recognition. It was able to simply play itself. And in fact, interestingly, it played actually fewer games by itself and did it a little bit more quickly and was able to actually exceed the abilities of any human in terms of the game of Go. Now, that's just a game, right? Wouldn't it be interesting if we could apply this technology to things that are a little bit more substantial, like that game of Go? And the answer is we have. So research several years ago uh, at Harvard and at Stanford, uh, lead author was Andrew Beck at Harvard, wanted to see if a machine learning algorithm could be better than a human pathologist at diagnosing severe forms of cancer. So it showed it lots of examples, and sure enough, it was able to divine from these biopsies and looking just at the patient survival rates, not knowing what to look for, the 11 telltale signs that best predict whether a biopsy is highly cancerous. The problem, medical literature only knew of eight of them. Three of the things that the machine learning algorithm identified were ones that human practitioners didn't know to look for. It was naked, it was, it was invisible to the human eye, but it was spotted by AI. Okay, so we know that the shift that we've had in the old form of AI, in this new world of machine learning and deep learning and reinforcement learning, we talk about it in terms of the sense that we have more computing power and we have more data. That's true, but that might not be the most germane thing going forward. We know that we're able to apply these inferences to all areas of life and actually get a feedback loop so it's constantly learning. And that's still important, but it might not be the most important thing that we need to think about that's truly novel. 
What I would argue is actually truly novel are two things. One is that we have feature extraction. That is to say, we don't need to know at the outset what the relevant variables are and the weightings and the features. That is surfaced through the algorithm, through the large body of data, and that the answer is probabilistic. And why I focus on these two things is going to come back to bite us, and I'll explain why in just a moment. So in other words, we have a lot more data, we have a lot more computing power, we can do new things with this technology. AI is going to be better than human beings in terms of the scale of what it does, the speed of what it does, and the accuracy of what it does, a little bit like the example of the human pathologist. But what's interesting here, if you think about it, is the argument of complexity, the question of will it know more than us? And the answer is, well, yes, absolutely. For one reason, it'll spot things in the data that we ourselves wouldn't have spotted. That is the example of pathology. And another example is, another reason why, is that it can search the entire problem space and come up with an answer that we ourselves wouldn't be able to figure out, simply because it can do it faster and better. And I'll give you an example of that. So if you wanted to create a cabin partition of an airplane, Airbus wanted to do that and had certain design constraints in terms of the size and the weight and the strength. And so what it was able to do was actually put it through what's called a generative algorithm. It makes lots of small little incremental changes, small little permutations at each increment for the purpose of seeing whether this is the optimal one or not. And instead of having a designers come up with 40 different prototypes, it had over 10,000 different prototypes, all with small little design changes until they found exactly the one that was optimal for the purpose at hand. In fact, it's something that could only be created by a 3D printer. And if you look at it, what's interesting is you don't have to know anything about aircraft design, and you know there was not a human mind that created this thing. <laughs> right? You can tell right away this was created by an algorithm, right? an alien intelligence. Right? ET created this. So what does this mean? Well, if you extend it a little bit further on in a very responsible way, not in a science fiction way, in a responsible way, the first thing that we'd know is that we could learn things that were almost unknowable in the past because it might have taken humanity 100 years to learn, and now we'll learn it a little bit more quickly. So it was only about 150 years ago that Faraday here demonstrated one of the most, one of the most basic fundamental uh, features of the physical universe that had always existed, right, electricity, for eons, right? But when Adam Smith was writing about uh, uh, the uh, human transactions and when Aristotle was coming up with the politics, they had no idea of electricity. So it begs the question, what are the fundamental features of the physical world that we live with all the time, every day, but we're actually unaware of, but we will become aware of with this new technique that will expose it to us in the same way that it's better than a human pathologist at diagnosing severe cancer. And so you can even think even more about almost an imaginary flight of fancy, but it need not be. Right? We know that mothers can almost have, a, new mothers can have a sense of when the baby's crying, it means it's scared, or it's hungry, or it's wet. So will we be able to use this technology instead of beating another algorithm at go? communicate with other animals, like dolphins. It sounds like science fiction. I think it's pro very practical and very reasonable to think, yeah, in certain ways, we may be able to use this technology to do just that. So if you think about where this goes, there is a rebuttal to be had to the critics of AI. And it comes into two flavors and two areas. And I want to use this moment to invoke the spirit of Thomas Huxley, who himself uh, took very strong stances at a time when people thought it was ridiculous, the case of evolution, and uh, Darwin's pit bull, right, to step forward and say there's, some, there's, a, there's a muscular rebuttal that needs to be made in defense of artificial intelligence. And the first one is in the area of jobs, and the second one is in safety. In the case of jobs, I think there is going to be a problem, but it's probably not going to be quite as dramatic as the naysayers believe. If you think of the case of pathologists, if we're able to learn new things, at low cost about our propensity for certain diseases or diseases that we have latent in ourselves, we might need more pathologists rather than fewer of them, but their job changes. They're more like healthcare coaches to us now. Likewise, in terms of safety, many people believe that AI can destroy humanity. Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, Bill Gates. Actually, I think that we need AI to save humanity. If you think about climate change and disease and managing cities on an efficient way, AI can help us do those things. I fear a world without AI. But it comes at a cost. Nothing's for free. And the two costs are in the area of privacy and transparency. And the issue, I think, the outcome, is not the one we'd be totally comfortable with. And so we need an important debate about that. 
The first one in terms of privacy. If, the, if you followed me so far that this data is so valuable and can, we can learn new things from it that we never could before, well, instead of having laws that actually obstruct the storage, collection, storage, and processing of personal information, you could say that, in fact, we might have a moral obligation to actually use personal information for the social good that it can bring, and we actually want to encourage this. Sure, we need rules around it, but what we do know is that when, <laughs> when the privacy regulator here in Britain beat up DeepMind for not following all the small little minutia of the privacy regulations, but we're trying to do an incredible thing by reducing disease for people who might otherwise die, they should be applauded for that rather than beaten over the head. You could say that we have a moral obligation to use data. The second, in terms of uh, transparency, the way the algorithms work, the way the feature extraction works, is that we know we get a better result, but we don't actually always know why it got that result. The, the, the statistical approach, the classical traditional statistical approach, is transparent. We have explainability. But the AI approach, the deep learning approach, is not transparent. We do not have explainability. It's locked up like a locked book. And so, although some people are creating software in which you can actually go from obscure to transparent uh, algorithms and you can choose it for compliance reasons, society's going to have to make a decision between performance and explainability and interpretability. And if you think about it, the default setting, the orthodox view is because we've had transparency in existing uh, relations of how human affairs are conducted, so too we need to preserve those same democratic safeguards of transparency and democratic accountability in the algorithm. And I'm not so sure. Now, I understand that the secular, that the secular and the scientific tradition was basically shucking a world of accepting knowledge on blind faith into using reason. But if you think about where it's headed, you might want to actually allow a little bit of faith in the algorithm as long as it's constantly being revalidated, even if you don't understand why, because you know that it's coming up with a better decision, that this is cancerous and this is not, that this self-driving car should turn this direction and not that way, that this person should be denied a loan rather than given one. It's going to be a tough thing for us to think about. And as we do this, and as algorithms make more decisions in the world, what it's going to come to is a question of what is true, what is ground truth. Not what the data represents, but what is really there. But there I'm optimistic too. Our tools have always allowed us to soar past what we appear to see into things that really are as they are.